we are going to uh, open up our singing this morning with Majestic. Majestic is your name in all the earth. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. How the Lord, greatness, the oceans cry out to you. The mountains, they bow down before you. So I'll join with the earth and I give my The heavens declare your greatness, the oceans cry out to you, the mountains they bow down before you, so I'll join with the earth and I give my praise to you. And we'll continue singing with higher ground. And we'll conclude our singing this morning with Mighty to Save. Oh, 
to save, He is mighty to save, forever author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, fill my life again. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. Singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountain. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save, forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave, Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save, forever. Author of salvation, he was and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Father God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for blessing us and just giving us the voices to sing your praises, Lord. We pray, Father God, that you would just take this service now that we can offer it up to you as a sacrifice of our love and devotion to you. Bless Nick now, Lord, as he comes and presents his message that you instilled on his heart, Lord. And we thank you, and we ask all these things in Jesus' wonderful and precious name. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, First, I just want to apologize ahead of time to Mr. Reed. Uh, I will try to stay within the lines up on the stage, but I can't promise that I will. Um, Second, I want to say good morning. So, unless you've been living under a rock or all by yourself in the middle of nowhere, uh, you should have noticed by now that there is a lot happening in our country. Uh, A lot is going on. Things are changing, and whether it's for the better or the worse, Time will tell, and movements are happening. And I'm not getting up here to discuss good, bad, right, wrong about those things. But one of the phrases that's being kind of taken as a motto uh, is the phrase, no justice, no peace. And to some, they take that as a threat. I don't think that's appropriate, but some do take that as a threat. However, I think the motto, no justice, no peace, is actually a pretty decent mindset for Christians to have. And and to develop it a little bit more, uh, we as Christians, if we see injustice, we should not be at peace, and that uneasiness, that uncomfortableness should drive us to fix whatever the problem is, whatever the injustice is. Whether it's nationwide, whether it's statewide, whether it's within the church, within your family, within your own heart. When, when we see injustice as Christians, we should not be okay with that, no matter the circumstances that's taking place. And the reason for this is because our God is a God who both does and delights in loving kindness, justice, and righteousness. And we as Christians should be doing the same. Our, our God is a God who both does and delights in loving kindness, justice, and righteousness, and we as his people should be doing the same. So, 
Turn with me to Jeremiah 9, uh, 23 to 26. Uh, while you're turning there, I will let you know that uh, Jeremiah 9, 23 to 24 is probably my life passage, uh, as pride is one of those areas of sin that I struggle with the most. And, and I find this verse helps me quite a bit to redirect my boasting. But Jeremiah 9, 23 to 26, reads this. Thus says the Lord, Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, that I will punish all who are circumcised and yet uncircumcised, Egypt and Judah, and Edom and all the sons of Ammon, and Moab and all those inhabiting the desert who clip the hair on their temples. For all the nations are uncircumcised and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised of heart. So before we get into these four verses, I want to give us a little bit of background as to kind of what's going on because you may be very unfamiliar with where we are in the Bible. Jeremiah is in the middle of his temple message. It's, it's called the temple message, and it spans from Jeremiah 7 to Jeremiah 10. It's called the temple message because when Jeremiah gives it, he's standing at the gate of the temple. To give you a modern equivalent to that, it would be like Jeremiah standing at the front doors of the church where the lobby is. And so standing at the temple gate means that everyone coming into the temple is hearing Jeremiah, and everybody in the outer temple court, and potentially even the inner temple court, hears Jeremiah. And I want us to get that picture in our head. There are a lot of people standing around Jeremiah listening to his message. It's not like he's on a mountaintop or having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with God. He is addressing the people at the temple. And this message, which starts in Jeremiah 7, starts with a promise. If you flip back just a few pages to Jeremiah 7... We'll be reading verse 3 and then verses 5 and 7. It starts off with a promise. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you dwell in this place. For if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly practice justice between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, nor walk after other gods to your own ruin, then I will let you dwell in this place in the land that I gave you to your fathers forever and ever. And passages like this in Jeremiah is why Jeremiah is my favorite book of the Bible, is because even though as you read through Jeremiah, the situation just gets worse and worse and worse, God is always casting them a lifeline. He, he is always saying to them, look, if you just turn from your wicked ways and turn back to me, you'll make it through this. But unfortunately, for the temple message, this is as positive as the message gets. Because what comes next is, in Jeremiah 7 to 9, is God listing off all of their sins that they've been committing. And to, to give you a list of them, there's been stealing, murder, adultery, lying, family idol worship, disobedience. They've been increasing in evil, as though their own sins were not bad enough. They are stubborn. They do not repent. They sacrifice their children in idol worship. There's apostasy. They glory in sin. So all these things I'm listing off, they're not ashamed of. They're not trying to hide it. They are proudly toting it. There's betrayal. There's backstabbing. There's slander. And because of all of these things, throughout the temple message, God is letting them know, yeah, there's judgment coming. And a great summation of that judgment, if you flip back to Jeremiah 9, is in Jeremiah 15 to 16 and then 20, or 21 to 22. So Jeremiah 9, 15. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will feed them, this people, with wormwood and give them poisoned water to drink. I will scatter them among the nations whom neither they nor their fathers have known, and I will send the sword after them until I have annihilated them. And then in verses 17 to 20, he calls for the wailing women, which were professional mourners. And this is what the mourners are to say. For death has come up through our windows. It has entered our palaces to cut off the children from the streets, the young men from the town squares. Speak, thus says the Lord, the corpses of men will fall like dung on the open field and like the sheaf after the reaper, but no one will gather them. 
we tend to not really focus on these kind of passages in the, in the Bible because they make us uncomfortable. They make us a little uneasy. We don't like to read about God's judgment. And this isn't directed at us. We're, we're reading this thousands of years in the future. Imagine being one of the people in the temple that Jeremiah is addressing this to. He has just called you out on all of your sins, and then on top of it, he's saying, and because of all these things, you are going to be removed from the face of the earth. As you can imagine, this doesn't sit well with the people who are hearing it. And they offer up some defenses. In fact, in Jeremiah 7, there is a response to one of their defenses, and we won't, we won't flip back there. But in Jeremiah 7, 9 to 11, there are the people's defense against these calls for impending doom is that they have the temple of the Lord. As long as they have the temple of the Lord, just like a good luck charm, the Lord will never destroy this place. It's, it's where God's house is. God won't destroy his own house. So we can live however we want, and as long as the temple's still standing, we're fine. In the next four verses, uh, Jeremiah 7, 12 to 15, God debunks that immediately. He tells them, well, I once lived in a tabernacle, and it was in a place called Shiloh. Shiloh is destroyed, and if you go there, you will see it. And I will do the same to this house. And so you can't use the fact that my house is here to excuse your rampant sin and to save you from judgment. And that's not the only mindset that can be implied from the passages in the temple message. Because another thing I want you to take into consideration is that at this point, this is early in Jeremiah's ministry, King Josiah, who if you know about uh, church, or church history, Israel's history, is the last good king Judah has. After King Josiah dies in battle against the Egyptians, they only have bad kings and then the Babylonians come and wipe everybody out. But right now, King Josiah is alive and well, and he is on fire for the Lord, doing reforms all across the nation. And so it wouldn't be much of a stretch for the people who hear Jeremiah's message of impending doom to point to their king and be like, no, we got the right guy in the highest office of the land. Judgment, it ain't going to come. King Josiah, he's on fire for the Lord. And even if judgment does come, whoever sends it, King Josiah, he's wise enough, he's smart enough to navigate those political waters. Or if he's not, we have an army big enough that we are exacting tribute from smaller countries around us, and all of our cities have big walls. So if someone shows up, we can take them. And even if we can't do that, stock market's doing really well. Gold and silver are a plenty. I mean, look at the temple. It's coated in gold, it's coated in silver. It's coated in copper and bronze. Push comes to shove. We just give them some money. They leave us alone. We are fine. We don't have to worry about this impending judgment you speak of. And then we get to verse 23. Thus says the Lord, Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches. The first thing I want you to notice is that this verse starts with, thus says the Lord. I don't know about you guys, but usually when it comes to my Bible reading, that's a phrase that I just kind of skip. But I don't want us to this time, because if, you, if your Bible does it the way my Bible does it, the word Lord is in all caps, capital L-O-R-D. That is the name Yahweh. This is, this is God's highest name. This is the name that God gave to Moses, saying that he was the great I Am. When Moses was going to take all the people out of Egypt. This is God's covenantal name. And what is the Lord saying? Yeah, don't boast in your wisdom. Don't boast in your power. Don't boast in your riches. And this word boast actually has a really pretty uh, imagery in it. It means to shine. And I, I really like that. It's, you can imagine whatever you boast about, like you being the rising sun. The sun is going to come up and it's going to cast sunlight on everything underneath it. Everything within its light is going to get sunlight. And when we boast, it's just like the sun coming up. We're going to be putting something out there, and everyone around us is going to be covered in it. Whether it's boasting about us, boasting about the Lord, our sun is going to rise. We are going to boast. And God tells them, yeah, 
don't trust in your wisdom. Don't trust in your might. Don't trust in your riches. Because in the face of judgment, all of your achievements don't help. In the face of judgment, all of your achievements, all of your might, all of your riches, all of your intelligence means nothing. It does nothing. And this is echoed elsewhere throughout the Bible. You don't have to flip there. But Psalm 49, 7 to 8 says, No man can by any means redeem his brother or give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of his soul is costly, and he should cease trying forever. And from the Lord's of Jesus Christ, or from the lips of our Lord Jesus Christ himself, Matthew 16, 26, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? In, in other words, if all of our achievements don't save us from judgment, what does? And this is where we get to verse 24. But let him who boasts, boast of this, that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for I delight in these things. The Nasby has the phrase, that he understands and knows me. And this phrase covers both knowing God through facts and kind of mentally knowing things about God, and knowing God through experience. And many of you here have both. You know about God from coming to church, uh, going to Bible study, going to Sunday school, youth group, reading the Bible on your own, but you've also experienced God through salvation. You've also experienced God through Jesus Christ. And that is the only thing that can help you when it comes to judgment. See, if you, have, if you have not already put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and what he's done for you on the cross, there is a day of judgment coming for you. And it's a lot worse than what the people in Jeremiah were going to be experiencing. It's a place called hell, and the worst part about it, and there are a lot of bad things about it, is it is a place where God is not. And we are sent there when we die because of our sins, because we have done things wrong and we have offended the holy God. And our works, our riches, our intelligence gets us nowhere. We can show up with all the stuff that you could ever imagine, and it amounts to nothing in the face of a holy God. But God gave us away. 2,000 years ago, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live a perfect life. And Jesus died on a cross in your place for your sins. The, the debt that you owed God because of your sins and that you could never pay off, Jesus took on himself. And he paid it through his own death. And he was buried. And so, in dying and being buried, he paid for sin. He paid the price for sin for you and for me. But he did not stay buried because three days later, he rose from the grave and had victory over death, had victory over sin, had victory over hell, and gave us a hope of eternal life. And so if you are not a Christian, if you have not made the salvation decision, I urge you to do so, especially in the face of impending judgment, because the only thing that matters is that you know and understand the Lord through his son, Jesus Christ. Through putting your trust, through putting your faith, that what Jesus Christ did on the cross in your place for your sins was enough to pay the sin debt you owed God, and that his burial and resurrection allows you entrance into heaven and, and gives you a right relationship with the Lord. And if you have questions, if you have concerns, if you have anything like that, please don't leave here without talking to me or one of the people you've seen up on the stage or the people next to you to get those questions answered because it is the most important decision you will ever make. And after salvation, once you've made that decision, you no longer have to fear judgment because Jesus has taken it on himself. He has taken that judgment for you. And so we are supposed to boast in the Lord, the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for he delights in these things. The Lord exercises these things. The, the word exercise means to do or make. It means to behave in a certain way, to have a certain behavior. So the Lord does loving kindness. The Lord does unfailing love. And, and this word for loving kindness is actually related to his faithfulness to the covenants. So you can think about it like, just as God's promises will never fail, so his love will never fail. It is unfailing love. If you have the ESV, they translate it steadfast love. If you have the Holman Christian, they translate it as faithful love. 
So the Lord does unfailing love. The Lord does justice. That means when he judges, he is free from bias. He is free from self-interest. He is free from favoritism. And the Lord does righteousness. And that means that everything he does is up to snuff. It's, it's up to, sna- to his holy, righteous standard. But this is also, there's also another side to the fact that the Lord does justice and righteousness and loving kindness. It's that he is actively against unrighteousness. He is actively against hate. He is actively against injustice. And we will see that come in verses 25 to 26. But before we move on to the delighting, what I also want you to notice is that the Lord thought it was important to include loving kindness, justice, and righteousness together. He did not say, I'm the Lord who exercises loving kindness. He did not say, I'm the Lord who exercises justice. He did not say, I'm the Lord who exercises righteousness. He included them all together. And what that means is, God's loving kindness does not negate his justice, but God's justice is always just because it is according to his righteousness. And God's righteousness helps his unfailing love. It does not act apart from it. But beyond the fact that the Lord does these things, he delights in them. And this word delights means that he is pleased with justice and loving kindness and righteousness. He loves them. Isaiah 61.8 starts by saying, For I, the Lord, love justice. And Micah 7.18 ends with, He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. And so we have two options to boast in. We boast in ourselves, or we boast in the Lord. The people, at the time, had decided they were going to boast in themselves. And where did it lead them? Stealing, murder, adultery, lying, family idol worship, all of those sins which are the exact opposite of loving kindness, justice, and righteousness. And all the boasting of verse 23 leads to the situation of verse 25 and 26. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord that I will punish all who are circumcised and yet uncircumcised, Egypt and Judah and Edom and the sons of Ammon and Moab and all those inhabiting the desert who clip the hair on their temples. For all the nations are uncircumcised and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised of heart. It leads to the situation that Jeremiah and the Lord call circumcised but uncircumcised to kind of give us a uh, present dispensation equivalent to that. It would be those who do everything right who do all the Christian things but aren't actually Christians themselves. And what this produces, this circumcised yet uncircumcised, it does not produce righteous people, but it does produce religious people. It produces highly religious people who say, I've gone to church my whole life. I've given plenty of money to the church and missions. I know all the books of the Bible. I've memorized all the right verses. I know the order of all the books in the Bible. I've even been a teacher. I've even been a minister. And they list off all the things that they've done. And if they've never been saved, it doesn't mean anything when it comes into the face of judgment. And something I think we often forget when we read the Old Testament is that the people who were not Jews, the the people who practiced the pagan religions, still had religion. They, they had a very deep religion. They had a whole mythology. They had a whole pantheon in some cases. They had religious holidays, religious rituals, religious ceremonies. They had holy days of the week. The only thing was there was no faith in the Lord. They, they were practicing the wrong religion, but in Israel's case, they were practicing the right religion. They were just doing it for the works. They were doing it relying on the fact that their works would get them saved, even though their hearts were far, far away from the Lord. And so we as Christians, those who have been saved, should be boasting in the Lord. And this is where, finally, thank you for waiting, uh, we get to us. Because the Jews at the time, in Jeremiah's address, are boasting in themselves and their works. But what if the only thing we as Christians did was boast in the Lord? What if we only gloried in and shined in the Lord? When when our sun came up in the morning, everyone was bathed 
in knowledge of the Lord because we just can't stop thinking about it. We can't stop talking about how great our Lord is and what he's done for us through his son, Jesus Christ. What do you think happens when we boast in the Lord who exercises loving kindness and justice and righteousness? When we boast in the Lord who is against hatred and who is against injustice and who is against unrighteousness, when we boast in the Lord who delights in unfailing love and justice and righteousness, and when we boast in the Lord who sent his son to die in our place, which, by the way, is the greatest example of love and justice and righteousness that the Lord has to offer. What do you think happens when our thoughts and our words are oriented on boasting in the Lord instead of ourselves? Our doing and our delighting begins to change, and it begins to come in line with the Lord's. And so we start to treat our children fairly, or our siblings fairly, or our parents fairly, or our friends fairly. We start to practice patiently loving coworkers, neighbors, friends, even when we don't like them, even when they get on our nerves. We strive to live up to God's holy standard, which is exemplified in Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you, you're not going to get there this side of heaven, but that doesn't mean you're, it's not worth it. It means that we, in our own life, we, when we have the ability to judge, when we have the ability to enact justice, we are fair. We don't lean towards our favorite child, which, kids, you can all ask, you know, who's, who's your parent's favorite once this is done? We don't practice bias because, oh, they're my political party, or they're my economic class, or they're from my neighborhood, or my hometown, or they're my family. We stand against hate. We stand against injustice, no matter who says it, whether it's our guy or the other guy, and no matter who it's enacted against, who, no matter who the injustice is enacted against, whether it's our guy or the other guys. And so this is the standard we are called to. And I'm not going to kid you, it's not easy. And it's definitely not comfortable. But our God is a God who both does and delights in loving kindness, justice, and righteousness. And we as his people should be doing the same. This is the God we serve. This is how the Lord has described himself in Jeremiah 9, 23 to 26. The one who does and delights in loving kindness, justice, and righteousness. And we as Christians, we know and understand the Lord better than non-Christians do. Because we've experienced him through his son, Jesus Christ, and our personal salvation, and we've experienced him through his word. And because of that, Christians should be the driving force for love. And Christians should be the most vocal voice against hatred. Christians should be the driving force for justice and the most vocal against injustice. Christians should be the one driving for righteousness and being the most against unrighteousness. And just as the Lord lumped all three of these together, so we have to make sure that we're doing it. Because justice without love and justice without righteousness often turns to injustice and often turns to cruelty. And righteousness without love turns to legalism. And love without justice and love without righteousness doesn't help anybody. It doesn't confront sin. And we should be the driving force for justice, love, and righteousness, no matter who's involved. No matter if it's red versus blue or blue versus red, black versus white or white versus black, whether it's rich versus poor, poor versus rich, young versus old, old versus young, whatever dichotomy you want and whatever group you want to throw yourself in, you don't, as a Christian, get to just practice righteousness, justice, and loving kindness to your side. That is not why the Lord has left you on the earth. And it's hard. It's a high standard and it's a tight rope to walk. And if you've ever seen anyone do a tight rope act, hopefully they had a net under them. Hopefully they had something to catch them so that if they did mess up, if they did fall off the tight rope, they didn't die. For Christians, as we walk this tight rope, our net is grace. Because you're going to mess up. You're going to fail. It's going to happen. But the grace catches us and it puts us right back up on that tight rope so that not only can we walk it, 
but we can lead those behind us on it as well. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for another day you've given us, and I thank you that you are a God of loving kindness, justice, and righteousness, and that you have given the greatest display of those attributes through your Son, Jesus Christ, and that we, by placing our faith and trust in what your Son has done for us on the cross, can experience that in a way that we cannot experience any other, and that we can be free from the fear of judgment and the impending threat of hell, but instead know that your son took it all on himself for us so that we have something to look forward to and that our relationship with the Lord while on earth is fixed. It is reconciled. And so I pray that if there's anyone who has not made that decision, that they would come talk to me, talk to the person next to them, ask their questions, voice their concerns, have a conversation that they would not leave here without knowing your gospel and knowing what your son has done for us. And I pray that in these tumultuous times, these kind of crazy times that America is going through right now, that Christians would not get caught up in the left versus right or black versus white or young versus old or any of those debates. But that as Christians, we would simply be pushing for what you do and what you love, which is love, justice, and righteousness. And that no matter the circumstance, no matter what happens, we would be the driving force for that and be leading others behind us. I pray all these things in your name. Amen. Please stand as we conclude our service with We Are an Offering. God, we thank you, Lord, that you've given us a spirit of love. Lord, I pray that we would have courage, Lord, to stand up for justice and kindness and peace. That you would just give us, Lord, the the words to say when approached about the subject, Lord, of where we stand and that we stand for you and that we should and will love all people. But most of all, that we would love a God who created us, who sent his one and only son to die for us. And Lord, and through our thoughts, our words, and our actions, Lord, that we would show Christ's love in all that we do. We thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us. And we thank you for this service today. Be with us now as we leave here, and we ask all these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.